Well, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank everybody who's still here. I know it's tough after a long day. You guys have had a lot of information put forth today, and I'm certainly going to try and go through mine. There's a lot of synergies in what I'm going to present on, and I'm going to try and connect some of the dots between the speakers this morning. I also uh, really want to thank Monty for bringing me here in the middle of winter at four degree weather in Iowa. Uh, it, was, it was on one of my top lists of things to do, and now I can check that off my bucket list, especially since I've retired. That being said, um, I am really happy to be here. There's a lot of things that I did in the agency uh, that I also felt that there were some things that have been left undone, so that's part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I, I think there's a couple things. One, yes, I'm a regulator. I was a regulator. I'm a former regulator. That is a reality. It is not an affliction. So it's not a disease or anything, so feel free to recognize me for a human being. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, think that uh, the relationships with EPA um, are often a little strained, but the reality is EPA is an agency that is caught in the crosshairs in the middle of everything. They don't have a constituency, a uh, very focused constituency like USDA or DOE might have, they, but they have everybody as a stakeholder in their processes. So I'm very sensitive to that. I've been on the inside for many, many years, um, almost, uh, almost 30 years actually in the agency. And I'm very proud of that, did a lot of great work, and again, a lot of the air quality uh, impacts that we have in this country, all the benefits we've had at this point in time, are a part of the Office of Transportation Air Quality, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that as well. Just brief on background, I mean, I did spend a lot of time in the agency, but I also did work in the private sector. I worked for the American Petroleum Institute, I worked for some private uh, energy company, I worked in a publication group. So I rounded off the rough edges and I was lucky enough to go back 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago actually, and work in the agency. And they utilized me as a tool for providing some strategic insight on really what you guys, all of the external stakeholders, would be thinking about our regulations. Hopefully our regulations are better for those. I uh, can't say that they're you know, always the best, but if you tick people off equally in all of the industries, then you've hit the bullseye and you've done a good job. So, so that's the reality. Um, I'm, I'm also, as they've said, I've been retired just almost a year right now, but I did make a decision last year that if I was going to engage, I was going to work with some good groups, and I really was going to focus on advanced and cellulosic biofuel sector. I've been able to do that, but I'm helping a number of different parties out in the private sector as well. Uh, and, and it's really actually nice to kind of be out from under the infrastructure of the federal government and to be able to move forward. And uh, people who know me, and I think part of the reason why Monty and, and others still continue to involve me in some of these things is you, you pretty much, what I say is pretty much what you get. I said it on the inside. I'm not saying anything different on the outside. So none of my former colleagues would actually be shocked at the things that I'm talking about. So I'm pretty happy about that as well. So today, what I'm gonna try and run through uh, quickly, and hopefully have some time for questions, and I wanna be sensitive to the people that are coming after me as well. But really, I'm gonna talk about what I believe the future of fuels are gonna be. And you heard this morning from John, you've heard from a lot of other people as well. There's lots of opportunities globally. Really, I'm focusing more on the US side of things. So what is it gonna be in this country? And John put all these projections out, which actually are, are really interesting and fascinating and food for thought in terms of you know, what the expectations might be going forward. But I'm really focusing more on some of the implications more near and midterm. And yeah, there's bumps in the roads. We often forget about the success that the industry has had. I mean, yeah, petroleum based products and transportation have been around for over 100 years. Ethanol is actually probably the first transportation fuel. It's just that when they found all the oil, it was cheaper to actually produce uh, gasoline. It was a good fit for the engines. They converted over and that's kind of the, been the history of that. As, but you know, over the past 20 years, uh, several decades certainly, look at the success that this industry has had. So you guys should be really proud of that. But we'll talk about what some of the influencing factors are. There's a lot of things that we know. We certainly know what we expect the production of gasoline and diesel is likely to be. And there's some charts in here I have later on, but it's really, it's not necessarily increasing. It's kind of plateauing. Uh, what that means is, is there is a, either a diminishing or a flat market for products and everybody's competing for those. What is the cleanest? What's the best? What is actually going to be the easiest? What's the most cost effective? Those are all things that the market decides Certainly the regulations have an influence over that as well. 
Sales projections, we pretty much know what's gonna happen. You can look to EIA and they have the annual outlook every year and they have long-term outlooks. So do they get that right? No, it's hard for anybody to really project out because there's a lot of things that can happen. There's global events that can happen. There's certainly domestic events and things that can happen as well. Whether you have a drought, whether there's uh, hurricanes and things, all of these things have some level of implications, but there is a lot of history and a lot of certainty behind these things. And it really is good to take a look at this stuff. So we know what types of fuels we have out there. Certainly it's predominantly gasoline and diesel. Jet fuel is a big one that's, um, that actually is increasing every year. It's a great opportunity for this industry as well. The petroleum projections are there. Feedstocks, what type of feedstocks we have? Well, you heard about oil. You know, OPEC doesn't necessarily do it. I understand we, the U.S. is going to be the largest exporter of petroleum um, in the world this year, beginning this year, which is, you know, in and of itself a testament to the technologies that have occurred and really the, the capabilities of technology to help uh, with production of those things. Feedstocks. You guys are all interested in corn and soy and, and other agricultural-based feedstocks, and certainly look at, look at the, what history has done in those areas as well. You know, yield per acre has gone up, uh, efficiency of conversions, all of those things factor into that. And that is actually looked at, and it's looked at in a lot of detail as you look at regulations. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be exact or precise because there's a lot of things that do influence that. But we have a pretty good understanding and expectations based on history about where things are going. Uh, going to go. Uh, renewable fuels, we know what the renewable fuel standard has done. We'll look at that in just a second, but it certainly has been a success story. There's opportunities for renewable fuels in the United States to continue to grow. The question is kind of what form and what um, and how are those going to be used, and there's a lot of influencing factors, and I'm going to focus on a couple of those things. This is really just showing, well, look, you know, in the downturn, boy, vehicle production went way down. People you know, lost a lot of money in the market. They couldn't necessarily go out. Their, their dispensable income and everything else was basically reduced. I know mine went down by about half. Uh, that being said, it affects the market. So you have something like that as a huge market factor in what could potentially happen and what is going to influence it. But we've rebounded. We're still producing a ton of vehicles. We've had record vehicle production. But you heard from John this morning also, you know, Teenagers, and I know this for a fact, I, I see it just anecdotally in a lot of the families uh, in our area. Kids don't go get their driver's license right away. Most of them eventually do when they realize that if they really want to go anywhere, even, even where I live, that you really need to have some transportation. It's a lot easier to go get in a car than it is to walk to the bus stop or get to the metro or something like that oftentimes. Now, if you live in the city, it may be a different thing. But we do know that vehicle projections are still you know, pretty, pretty strong here in the United States. When you look at other countries, though, and you heard a lot about China, and the markets there are going to be tremendous. And, and John also talked about the electric vehicle. They want to go, you know, 100% electric. Well, if you take that out, even if you have an increasing market for ethanol over the coming years in that particular area, because they're going to go to E10, if they have some edict in place, and, and again, in, in that regime, they could basically say, we're going to get rid of all of those things. Well, you have a market, and then that market disappears. So these are the types of things you have to think about when you look, not just domestically, but looking globally. What are those factors going to be that you need to consider, and what your opportunities are going to be, and plan for that. You really have to plan. Here it shows in the U.S. basically a, a somewhat of a declining market. Um, same thing, in a, but, but China, and, and again, China, I think singularly, is the biggest uh, growing market for private transportation fuels. Um, from a liquid fuels perspective, and again, it doesn't really matter if you look at these things. These are really just a reflection of kind of the market and what the expectations and projections might be. But at some point, if you don't have increasing number of vehicles and you flatten that and you flatten consumption, demand for these products, then you're really going to have, unless things change, either regulatorily or the market makes decisions because of economics or other reasons, you may end up with a flat market. So if it's not growing, what do you do? You need to find other markets, you need to find other products, or you need to find a different direction. But if you look at those things, we do have a pretty good indication what's going to happen over the next five to ten years. And the projections that John showed this morning, again, to really change the market over, I mean, I concur with a lot of those things. I went through the lead phase down program, and it took over 20 years for that to happen, uh, even, if, even though it was done regulatorily. So there's a lot of things in history that can help us and help you guys plan for where those opportunities might be and also where the cautionary flags might be. 
So what do we know about today's gasoline market? Well, we know nearly all gasoline has E10. So we're actually, from a percentage basis, uh, we're over 10% of gasoline, the gasoline pool in the United States right now. What that means is there's still a little bit of E0 here and there, there's some E15, now, we'll talk about the E15 thing in a, in a minute, but, and there's some E85, and actually I'll talk more about E85 projections, uh, which are some interesting facts that we have. But the blend wall, say, oh, don't say what the blend wall is. Well, okay, the blend wall is no longer E10, it's really E15, if you're just focusing on the gasoline pool. So five more volume percent across the entire gasoline pool, well, that does create an opportunity for billions of gallons if the entire thing converts over. There are some market obstacles. There, the regulatory obstacle looks like it's going to be removed. We'll see what happens with that, but the market still needs time to respond to that thing. And by everybody's accord, you know, Jeff Cooper and everybody else who's involved in these things, you look at that, they're not expecting miracles and they're not expecting this transition to happen overnight. It'll definitely happen slowly. But I do agree with John, the economics of this for retailers and for consumers to respond to this, it's there you certainly can see a big uptick in the number of stations and therefore the distribution system can help supply additional volumes into the market. So it's there. Um, there are some other limitations though which you have to think about and they, I won't say that they're, they're not real. They are real in terms of concerns, underground storage tank pumps and things like that. But all of these pumps nowadays pretty much are going to be turned over by the time you really get to saturation for higher blends. And I think most people are expecting, if I'm going to have to change my pumps and I'm going to prepare for those things, I better well do it now so that I'm ready. Because if other marketers are ahead of me and I'm not ready for that and those fuels come to market and I can't provide cost competitive products to the market like those people are, then I'm going to I'm going to be in a world of hurt. So there are some of those type of legal issues, consumer issues, uh, acceptance, uh, whether or not it's E15 or whether it's E85. E85 pricing has obviously been a big issue over the, the course of years. And I know a lot of people, you guys may see a lot of E85 around here. It's not necessarily around other parts of the country. Uh, anecdotally, uh, an E85 station, which there's very few of where I live, the one which I did go to and it did have E85, it was usually priced only a couple cents a gallon below E10. And if you ever drive on E85 and verse it with E10, you'll know the energy parity is not there. You're going to be coming back to the station a lot more. That's a real fact. doesn't mean E85 is a bad fuel. All it means is, is that if you're a consumer, you're going to want to spend, may spend a lower price, but once you realize that lower price is actually costing you money and time, you may not do that. Other places, it's different. Uh, let's move on here. So how could things change? And I do believe they not only can, but they will change. I think it's really important to, to look at those things. Certainly, um, if you guys are not familiar with the safe, affordable uh, fuel efficiency rule, it's called the SAFE rule. John just touched on it this morning. You guys should be. That's the fuel efficiency standards and the greenhouse gas emission standards for the light duty and medium duty fleet. Uh, those were implemented. They have been implemented, they've been operating. One key thing that I want to focus on there though is, as of 2019, any of the manufacturer credits for the production of an FFE, they all went away. They got credit, efficiency standards, CAFE standard credits for producing those vehicles. And it helped them meet the standards. Those things are gone. How many manufacturers are going to continue to produce FFVs? If you don't have FFVs, you can't sell E85. You'll have a declining market of those vehicles, which will be phased out over time. Vehicles last a long time, but eventually, if you don't produce something, they're all gone. They're in a barn or a junkyard somewhere. So you can't use those fuels. So E85 will actually have a diminishing market. We don't want that. We want the ability for the, the credits to be reinstated, and we'll focus on that as well. And I'm actually doing some work with a group out of California on that. Uh, there's also growing opportunities for non-ethanol fuels. I know you guys may not want to hear that, uh, but there is no ethanol mandate. There is only renewable fuel requirements. It just so happens that the best, most logical, most cost-effective fuel to meet the standards is through ethanol and it has obviously been around for, you know, for decades and being used in the automotive sector. And the vehicles are designed for all of this as well. So it just makes sense from a market perspective. But the reality is you can also meet these standards in other ways. The majority of the fuels um, beyond this 
15 billion gallon standard, if you will, and call it a standard, it's really not, um, it are that there's opportunities for cellulosic and advanced biofuels, and there is technologies out there to take biomass, convert it into what's called renewable crude and run it through a refinery. And then you produce, in that refinery, just like you're producing from crude, you produce gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, heating oil. So there is opportunities, and that's very transparent to the existing market. So pretty cool stuff, there's, and again, there's a lot of fuels and feedstocks in EPA's process that have been validated and, and could be used, but they have to be economical, and they aren't right now. But there are some that could be economical, but there's some regulatory impediments that are in place as well. And I can talk a little bit about those later on. And I will get into the legislative stuff. I, I agreed with some of the stuff that was set up here earlier. I also have a varying opinion about, um, uh, about legislation, but I do want to point out later on also that there is a real interest in, um, in what's going on this year at the agency, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, the last bullet on there, sorry, was blending over blending. So if you take this renewable crude, run it through a refinery, and you produce renewable gasoline or diesel, it doesn't prevent downstream blending of ethanol. You can just overlay 10% or 15% back into that same gallon, even though that has a renewable component to it and you get REN credits for that, you still can blend ethanol downstream. So it doesn't prohibit or inhibit the ability for the downstream sector to still put ethanol in. So this, um, this rule, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but this is what I mentioned. The reason why it's important for you guys is because FFVs are an opportunity in today's market in the near-term market and a bridge to the, to the future market. If you want liquid fuels, if you want ethanol to be a part of the, the future of liquid transportation fuels and the efficiency standards matters, the, the manufacturers need to have an incentive to continue to produce an FFV. If they can't, they can't you know, put more ethanol in, they won't be using ethanol. So you really need to focus on this, and I don't know if the slides will be available or not later on, but there's some things that you can do, and again, we're working an initiative trying to get DOT, NHTSA, and EPA to really reinstate these FFE credits for the production of these vehicles. High-octane fuels. These vehicles can use anything, E10, E0, E15, E20, E85, whatever it is. It's good for the consumers. It does not inhibit the ability for those consumers to use any future product in all the, the conversations that have been talked about. So that's why it's important to pay attention. Um, real quick, E85 projections. There's a lot of new data. This actually came out in December, November or December, and it's great for us because we're kind of getting the merging of data that's going to be helpful for us make our case to EPA and NHTSA. So the projections by DOE and EIA are that there's actually going to be increased amount of sales of uh, V85. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but there's another study. So in California, Pearson Fuels is the, the, the group that I'm working with, actually, but they have seen year over year greater than 30% sales increases over the last five years. Why is that? Well, low carbon fuel program is certainly bringing in lower carbon ethanol. The uh, more ethanol that's in a gasoline, the more credit you get uh, under the low carbon fuel standard program. The more credit you get, you saw the prices uh, for the for carbon there in California, then the more incentives there are in for the market and you can reduce the price of E85 in comparison to gasoline and you sell a lot more because consumers really are price sensitive. And it does make sense. It's almost energy parity, I believe, in what the prices are. So that's a great thing. Um, I mentioned California and I mentioned uh, uh, there were some Iowa and Minnesota data as well. Those are all showing between 25 and 35 percent sales increases over the last year, December uh, of 2017 through December of 2018. Why is that? What is happening to, to make that happen? And, you know, I think uh, the Irwin study is, is a good place to kind of look into and delve into to have a better understanding of that. But that, that data right there is helping us go and make our case for why a national F factor needs to be increased and reinstated in, in the SAFE rule. I'll say, so moving beyond that, what other factors, I always think, when I put this trains, planes, and automobiles in here, I don't know if you guys remember that movie, but I wrote John Candy and, and Steve Martin, and those aren't pillows. Um, anyway, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> hopefully you'll go take a look at it, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. But 
Uh, but there's a lot, these factors, the efficiency standards we just talked about, what is it going to be? Is it going to be electric vehicles? If it is, obviously, then you know, you're not losing a liquid transportation fuel. Hybrid vehicles, you still can, like John talked about, you know, kind of the convergence of electric and, and hybrid uh, together into technologies. You still, if you're using liquid there for the hybrid portion of that, well, maybe it could be 100% ethanol. Maybe it's not limited to, you know, it has to be gasoline. There could be a lot of things that could happen in the future. These new technologies, they talked about downsizing, engine optimization, uh, how octane could help with efficiency standards. Again, the bridge of, of the 85 uh, uh, type vehicles, FFE vehicles on this. So uh, those are things, but there's societal issues, workforce changes. You know, people are getting out of cars. People are and maybe gonna be going to these self-driving cars. I, for one, am not. <laughs> Damn it, do not take my fuel away and do not take my car away. I, I love driving. I don't know how I got into fuels, but, but I have been stuck in this. Uh, there's consumer choices. Most people are going to trucks or CUVs. I call them, and they say they're compact utility vehicles. I call them cute utility vehicles because it's basically a car shrunk, lifted. You know, it's, it's really the same type of technologies, but they raised it and they make it look like a, a little truck or SUV. Um, that's because that's what people want. And a lot of the manufacturers are moving away from cars. Ford's getting rid of them. GM's. Um, losing some models. Uh, most of the, uh, the international companies are still maintaining some level of cars, but, but really overall in this country, and you look out here, it's trucks everywhere. So um, the, the last two things I'm gonna mention on here are the jet and distillate market. Jet is increasing. I mean, everybody's flying everywhere nowadays. The amount of jet fuel that's needed in this country continues to grow. I think it's, I, I don't even know what the, I don't wanna state a number unless I, I really knew it for sure, but it's tremendous amount. That is a great place for clean, lower carbon fuels um, made from renewable products to actually get into the market. It's a huge amount of volume, and these, these guys are international, so they ultimately need fuel. They need more fuel, and they need lower carbon fuel because of all of what these countries are doing in terms of reducing greenhouse gases to address climate change. It's a huge market. And then the IMO, the in, uh, International Maritime Organization, and this is a, a little bit of a scare tactic, so to speak, but I've heard presentations where people have said, because of the low sulfur fuel and emission requirements under the IMO, where when they get into a certain distance from the country's borders, they ultimately need to switch to a cleaner fuel because they have these emission standards. That could potentially suck all the clean diesel and lower sulfur diesel out of the transportation market on land, move it to the ships, and that, that is certainly gonna have an impact on on the ability of supply. There's only so much diesel you can get out of refineries. So do you build new refineries? How do you optimize for diesel? How do you optimize uh, for additional sulfur reduction and those things? Those are all things that really need to be looked at more carefully. And then um, the last thing I'll talk about here is uh, legislation in a second. I did want to talk about RFS. That was me in the middle there saying help when I was working there. Uh, it's still them right now. How many people in this room think they really fully understand the RFS program? Okay, well, there's one. That's good, and I'll, I'll debate with anybody. Nobody really understands the program like EPA. Uh, we won't get into to details on that, but, but there's a lot still that, that most people really don't understand. But the good news is here, we're at 20 billion gallons under the RFS. The remaining gallons are supposed to come from advanced and cellulosic, but we're at 20 billion gallons. That's a true testament to the ability for the industry to, to satisfy this. Um, Again, the nested nature of this program, it is complicated. It certainly is. But really, you say at the bottom, it must be cellulosic feedstocks. It must be cellulosic fuels that were produced out of that. And then they, those are the fuels with the lowest greenhouse gas emissions. So it's complicated, but really, we know where we are. We know where, what we have to do. These, are, again, are the volumes that, uh, you know, again, success. You look at it incrementally, increases from year to year to year. We're almost at uh, 20 billion gallons. What comes next? Well, the two things on the right side that just flipped in is reset, which you heard a little bit about of, and then set. This program doesn't go away unless Congress tell, makes it go away, but it does put it in the hands of the agency. What do we need to consider when we look at these rules and regulations? Things to consider. Environmental impacts, the social, societal issues, the economic issues associated with it. If you look there in the middle, are these things equitably applied? Are they bearable by the industry, frankly, by society? 
Are they sustainable? Because that's a, a huge buzzword that everybody uses. It, it goes sustainability in a lot of ways. Can you keep producing them or not? And then are they viable? This is what EPA has to deal with. What's equitable, what's viable, what's implementable. I mean, again, if you can't design something you can implement, you might as well forget it. Everybody is involved, every stakeholder. They're at the bullseye of every single person, every industry in, in um, the country that has some interest, feedstock be it, distribution, supply, production, whatever it may be, and they all have their own vantages. So when they're hearing from people or an industry, they're hearing from a multitude of different uh, interests, even from within the same industry. So what's next with the RFS? Got to still set the standards. They're going to be doing reset. They'll still have to set, set the standards even after they do reset this year. What is reset? <laughs> well, if I'm Tom Brady and I have, you know, two backs and, and three receivers and whatever else, it could be a lot of things, and I could also run the ball. You have to really look very closely at what EPA's task is to do this, and you don't necessarily know where they're going to go, but you want to anticipate everything that they're going to have to look at. These are the details of reset. You heard some about that this morning. All I can tell you, my kind of my biggest message is pay attention. Reset is going to be somewhat inconsequential because all they're going to really do, in my view, is they're going to reduce the cellulosic number and hence reduce the, the advanced number and then hence reduce uh, the total number. But it's really you're going to end up pretty much what you might expect you might end up for next year. So you're not going to see a lot of change other than the numbers officially are removed and they're no longer the congressionally applicable numbers. So that's what I expect is going to happen. But the criteria they're going to use, the six criteria you heard about, which is really like 20, pay attention to how they view those things, where they put the most weight on those things. Is it energy, rural development, environment, whatever it may be. So pay attention to those things. Set is 2023 and beyond. And my real focus there is if in 2023, uh, and beyond. They still have to use these criteria, but they have a completely blank slate. So EPA has it really in their hands, which means it's in everybody else's interest, to, they could do and change the program almost entirely from what it is. Um, these things were all talked about this morning. These are all near-term horizon issues, so I really don't want to get into those things other than I will say with regard to E15, if E15 is done on time, which I believe it can be done on time, um, People don't believe transparency is going to be in there. It, it very well could be. If it is, I think it'll be a shell of what it would be if they had the time to actually do it, so they may not. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of work that still remains to be done on that. And finally, the likelihood of congressional help. Um, <laughs> I would be scratching my head. There's, there's proposals that are out there. Actually, some of the proposals are good baselines. But you guys may want to think about engaging congressional representatives on what reform might really need to be and look like. Instead of saying no, I would start putting together your own thoughts and proposals because if EPA does the set rule, you may not like what they come up with. You may be better off actually coming up with something on your own and getting Congress to reenact something new. Not saying it goes away, I'm just saying it needs to something, be something new. And with that, I know I'm over my time, but thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Do we have time for questions? How about one question for me? Oh, God, it would have to be you, Monty. <laughs> uh, we heard uh, you agree with former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt and some of our panelists this morning that if the EPA wanted to, they could actually, uh, in reset, put uh, the, the, the uh, whatever you want to call it, the implied conventional number at above 15 billion gallons. Yes, I believe that they could go above the 15 billion gallons. That being said, I don't think they will. Um, I yeah. Now, if you look at the act, you know, corn, starch based ethanol cannot be advanced. That's true. So you can't put that in towards an advanced pool in the yep. future. But I do believe that there is not a hard restriction on the ability for the conventional pool to go towards satisfying the total pool. Um, and therefore, you could go above the implied. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. you.